Okay, let's preach. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to jump around a little bit for time's sake, but if you have time today, I, I would dig into this, this entire chapter carried over into Hebrews 10. It'll be good for you. Hebrews chapter 9, starting at verse 6. It says, When everything had been arranged, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on the ministry. But only the high priest entered into the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. For the Holy Spirit was showing by that that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed for as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. For this is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper, verse 11, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with mere human hands, for that is to say is not part of this creation. For he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. But how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. And finally, verse 22, and we'll end our reading today. Sorry, verse 28. No, no, let's go to verse 22, 22. And in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. Catch this. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. God, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the Bible. We thank you, God, that when we read it, it is revelation. God, it is, it is impartation. God, it, it gets in us as believers. God, that's the way that you speak to us is through your word. God, if we want you to speak to us, God, we got to get in your word. And when we read it, God, you begin to speak and minister. And so, Father, we, we pray that you take this text today, that you would open up this text, that you would, you would speak it. And, God, you would, you, would, you would divide it and place it into the lives and hearts of people where they're living. God, that we may walk out of this room not different, but changed. And, God, we thank you in advance for the power of the word and the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name I ask it. And everybody says amen and amen. If you're taking notes, I've tagged the title this morning, Benefits, Benefits of the Blood. Benefits of the Blood. I love today. I love Easter Sunday. I love all that it is. I love all that it represents. But can I tell you, the reason that we can party on Sunday is because Jesus said yes on Friday. What what, what happened on Friday made what happens today possible. But if Jesus would not have said yes on Friday, we wouldn't be here in the same celebration that we are today. But how many people are thankful that Jesus was willing to say yes on Friday, come on, to make something happen on Sunday? I I love Easter Sunday, but I also love looking back at the sacrifice that Jesus made, not only for me and not only for you, but for the entire world, and not just for our present sin or our past sin, but every sin that we would ever commit is under the blood of Jesus. Friday, let me say it this way, Friday fixed our main issue. The main issue we're facing in humanity is this big honking neon uh, sign called sin, Sin separates us from God. It's, it's what separates us from God, the love of God. It's sin. It gets in the way. It's, we're all, the Bible says we are, we are all born into sin. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And Friday, when Jesus went to the cross, Friday fixed our main issue. Because the biggest issue we had today is not only me, but you. We are all sinners. We've all crossed the line. We've all messed up. We've all done things we wish we wouldn't have done. We've all said things we wish we wouldn't have said. We've all reacted in ways we wish we wouldn't have reacted in. We have all partaken in things and done things that we, if we could, we'd go back and undo them if we could. We are all in this same spot today. We are in this life and living in this land of sin. Make no mistake about it, I, I have sinned in my life. 
I am just the president or the pastor of the jacked up people of the warehouse church. I am in the same posture and the same position. I'm just as jacked up as you are. I was just dumb enough to say yes to the call of ministry. And so we find ourselves today all with this problem called sin. And Friday, when Jesus hung on the cross, come on, Friday fixed our main issue. Jesus Christ crucified, hear me, meets our greatest need. We don't need more money. Well, we do for the building, but we don't need more money. We don't need more friends. That's not our greatest need. Our greatest need was fixed on Friday with Jesus being crucified. Our greatest need, our most fundamental need as people, as humans, we were in need of a savior. If we had needed money, God would have sent us an economist. If we needed wisdom, God would have sent us a philosopher. But when God looked at the earth that he created and saw the fall of man and saw there was, there was a block between him and his creation, he knew that we didn't need an economist. He knew we didn't need a philosopher. He, he, what he knew is we needed a savior that would come and live and die on a cross and shed his blood and go to the grave and overcome death. He knew we were in need of a savior. I'm, not, I'm telling you, Friday, don't, don't, don't devalue the importance of Friday. But his blood, when Jesus shed his blood, it was for the purchase of our sin. I've got it wrote down this way, Jesus died so we don't have to. Jesus, Jesus was the sacrifice. He paid a debt that you and I could not pay. We couldn't work. We, couldn't, we, could, not, we could never pay, pay back our sin debt. Do you understand that today? Like it, does, it doesn't matter how much money you have, how much influence you have, how many good deeds that you've done. Jesus knew that we could never pay back the debt that our sin cost us. And so Jesus knew that the only way to redeem humanity was through the shed blood as he hung and died on that cross on Friday. Come on, we racked up a bill. Some, some people's bills are longer, but it, it's, it's not. We, we all have a bill that we've racked up. We have all fallen short. We have all messed up. Can I tell you, we are all in need of a Savior today. And as I began to study this, I, see, I'm, I'm a church kid. I, I grew up in church, raised in church. I, I, I spent my whole life in church. I grew up, I grew up hearing great preachers preach about the blood. You, you, you can watch some preachers today, but watch some preachers next week. You know what's not being talked about no more in culture? The blood. But I grew up hearing great preachers preach about the blood. And I sang old great hymnals. I know I, I don't look uh, you know, young enough, but I grew up singing songs like the blood will never lose its power. And I remember we had old, old gray hairs in the church that couldn't sing a lick, but they would belt out that hymn, and, and there was power, come on, when they began to sing out of those old hymns that the blood would, and I just come to remind you today, the blood has not lost its power. I sang songs growing up about nothing but the blood. And I've come to remind you, you, you can gain the whole world. But there ain't nothing but the blood of Jesus that, come on, that can cover your sin. And How about this one? I wish I had a piano player that could play these because we'd sing them as a church today. How about this? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? I don't know the rest of it, but I remember those two lines. But I grew, up, I, I grew up hearing these songs and they're in me. You understand? Because I was raised in church and came to church. It's what was in me 30 years ago. I can still go back and pull from the things that my parents brought me to church. And just because I was in the environment, you hear me today. So I began to study this idea of blood. And why was there so many preachers preaching about it? Why was there so many songs sang about it? And I... I, I discovered in the Bible that over 700 times blood is mentioned in the Bible. David referred to the incorruptible blood. Blood was used in the Old Testament as a sacrifice or an offering for the payment of sin. 
Peter spoke of the precious blood. John wrote of the overcoming power of the blood. Jesus mentioned his blood sitting around the table at Passover. We're told in Leviticus 17 verse 11 that the life of the flesh is in the blood, not just physically, but also spiritually. That is, in, in the natural, if your blood supplies, it, it, it supplies life-giving oxygen and nutrients to every cell in your body. And we also know that if the flow of blood is cut off to, a, to an extremity in your, in your arm, it will eventually start to die and decay. And the same is, is true in the spiritual. If we have areas in our life that we have blocked the blood, you will begin to lose part of your spiritual nature. Are you following me today? There is still power found in the blood. I found out that your blood also carries away wastes and toxins from your cells. Spiritually, without the blood of Jesus, your life and my life would be filled with filth, just like that of the Pharisees. I went, I went on to study and found out that our body that God has designed, all the, by the way, we, we do believe that God made man and woman. We don't, we don't believe that we somehow got Adam's foot. We don't, no, 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 we believe that God was a creation of the human body and he saw fit to, 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 to make it with white blood cells that fight off sickness, that we have natural remedies already inside of us to fight off every virus that comes our way physically and spiritually, by the way. And we have these white blood cells, come on, that will start destroying the invaders, and so when your natural blood is healthy, you are protected from disease, but when you, are, and you, when you are spiritually healthy, the same is true. There's not one thing that the devil can bring against you that the blood of Jesus isn't sufficient to overcome. And so I just want to remind you today that, that there is still power in the blood. There is, there is absolutely, without a doubt, benefits of the blood. Number one, if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you four real quick and we'll get out of your hair today. Number one, the blood established a new covenant. The blood established a new covenant. In the Old Testament, it was normal for an animal or a lamb to be sacrificed upon an altar as an act of worship to God for the means of atoning for sin. The Old Testament, they were always looking for the blood of an animal or the blood of a lamb. And they always were looking for the spotless lamb. And how many people know when Jesus came, Jesus came, there's referred to as the spotless lamb in the New Testament. Jesus came not to get rid of the Old Testament. He, he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. Jesus was, was the fulfillment of every Old Testament pro prophecy that you will find in this book. And in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, you would have to you would have to you would have to work your way to God. You would have to you would have to go through a priest. And the Old Testament, there was still a blood covenant, but it was a covenant that was designed around the shedding of the blood of an animal for the sacrifice or the atonement or the payment for sin. But when Jesus shows up and says, "I am here to establish a new covenant," can I tell you the new covenant is great news for people like you and people like me. Like we no longer have to operate under the old law, but now Jesus came to fulfill the law, not, not to get rid of it. The Old Testament still works. There's still commandments, thou shalt not murder. How many people know we should follow that commandment? We're not going to get rid of the Old Testament and say it's irrelevant. No, the Old Testament is just one big honking neon sign pointing to the coming of Jesus. And so a new covenant, hear me, is great news. For an old covenant would require you and I to be oppressed under the law. We would have to work. We would have to go to a man in order to get to God. Old Testament created physical obedience. They were all about works. They were all about the outside. They were all about what you did and what people thought and how you dressed. The New Testament was, is all about spiritual obedience. Jesus is not saying it doesn't matter how you act. But Jesus knew, i got to get into the inside, that will in turn affect the outside. We're not saying that just because grace is here, you can, you can still sin. That's not what the Bible teaches. But the Bible teaches, if I can get your heart right, it'll eventually take care of the outside. But in the Old Testament, the Old Testament people were always consumed with, how well do you look? How many tassels do you have? What do other people think? What rank are you? And Jesus came, walked onto the scene and says, you know what, I am here to get rid of the old way and invite people into a new way because Jesus knew it's all about the heart. It's the heart, it's the heart, it's the heart. 
Jesus was teaching and all of his teachings, it was, it was about if he can get my heart right, if he can get your heart right, your body and actions will follow. If he can get your heart right, your language will follow. Because if your heart's not right, you'll cuss and not even think about it. But if your heart's right, you won't say those words because they won't sit right with the Spirit. But Jesus, if I can get your heart right, you're not going to think perfectly, but you're going to think differently. Because if he can get our heart right, our mind will follow, our steps will follow. If, he can, if we can begin to learn to, to love God right, Jesus knew that we cannot love people without first loving God, and we cannot first love God without loving people, and we don't love on the outside. we got to go to work by loving on the inside. Jesus came on and said, I know you used to celebrate the old ways, but don't, don't get so caught up in celebrating how well people look on the outside, but learn to rejoice when you, give, when, when, when you forgive freely. Learn to rejoice when you give freely. Learn to rejoice when you start thinking the right. Learn to rejoice when you begin to love unconditionally. Jesus knew that i got to go to work on the inside. We have a church and a world that is focused on the outside. That's why we have Instagram. That's why we have Snapchat. That's why we have 500 filters on our phone. Why? Because we are addicted to the outside. And Jesus knew that if, if I can just get somebody's heart right, if I can just change their heart, if I can just get my love into their life, it will change every ounce of their being. It will change the way they operate. It will change the way they treat people. Jesus knew that I've got to get to the heart of the people. You know why we have so many people in the church today that are absent of fruit in their life? Why we have so many churches that are judgmental and hateful and closed off. Let me tell you why. It's because we have grown to be satisfied with bringing our body to church but leaving our heart in the car. And the devil is okay today with your body being in the room but your heart still being in the car. Because if your heart is not changed, it does no good to change the body. We, we, G, G, Jesus, knew, Jesus knew that Jesus knew that in order to have true change, change, true change does not happen on the outside first. It happens on the inside first. Salvation happens not on the outside. Salvation happens on the inside. Come on, when I was saved in 1997, it didn't happen on the outside. I felt the call of God on the inside. I felt this pulling. I felt this conviction. And I found myself humped over in order in front of hundreds of people sobbing uncontrollably. What was Jesus doing? He was giving me a new heart. And because he changed my heart, he now began to change my life. And so Jesus came to bring a new covenant. A new covenant is it's great news. It's encouraging news. Think about it. If we have to still operate under the Old Testament, how many animals would die on the daily because of my sin and because of your sin? There would be no humane society in Parkersburg. I mean, I know some of you think you're good and perfect today, but no, you're a sinner just like me. And if we had to sacrifice an animal every time we sinned, can you imagine every corrupt thought you ever thought had to be brought under the blood of a shed blood of an animal? Aren't you grateful today that we have a new covenant? In the old covenant, you would have to come to a priest and tell the priest everything, kind of like the, kind of like the Catholics, but that ain't really biblical. Because Jesus brought a new covenant that we don't go to a man and confess our sin, but the veil was torn and now we can go boldly into the throne room of grace. In other words, we have complete access to the Father. Could you imagine having to come to me and tell me all of the wicked thoughts that you think? How much fun would that be? I would not need to study for another sermon the rest of my ministry. But aren't we grateful today that there's a new covenant? People come all the time and say, preacher, I want you to pray for me. And I'll pray for people. But can I tell you, I don't have a special line from God. He did not give me a special number for being a pastor. 
I've got the same access you do. I've got the same connection you do. What I want to teach our church this year is learn to lay hands on yourself and pray healing over yourself. Learn to lay your hands on your kid and pray a a blessing on your kid. Learn to walk around and speak blessing over your family. You don't got to have the pastor do it. I'll do it and I'll put oil on you and I'll believe in faith, but I ain't got no special line. And so Jesus, come on, Jesus brought a new covenant. That's great news, isn't it? That we have access to God one-on-one. How amazing is it? Think about it. The God of all creation. When you ask him, he hears you. We can walk daily with God, our creator. Is that not mind-blowing? Well, preacher, I prayed it, it, didn't, it didn't come to pass. You gave up too early. Just because it doesn't, doesn't happen instantly doesn't mean God's not working it. But we have access. We get a daily walk with God. We get a daily communion with God. Preacher, I don't really hear God talk to me much. When's the last time you opened up the book and read it? Like God, will, if, you, if, you, if you open up this book, I promise you, he will speak to you. You'll read scriptures and all of a sudden you'll see a TV on the commercial about the scripture. It'll be like, God, are you trying to tell me something? Yes, he's trying to tell you something. You mean he'll use a commercial? If he used a raven to feed Elijah under the juniper tree, don't you think God maybe used a commercial to grasp your attention? But we're under a new covenant, and that's good news. There's no more dotting I's and crossing the T's. Can I tell you, like being in the new covenant means we don't have to work our way to God no more. God knew no matter how much we work, we could not get to God. And so God knew they ain't never going to get to me, so I'm going to send my son to them. And so we see bankrupted heaven, and Jesus came to earth, and we know the story. Why? Because Jesus wanted to bring a new covenant. Number two, the blood brings, prote- the blood brings protection. Come on, we need, we need the blood of Jesus to protect us. Exodus 12, Moses called the elders of Israel together and said to them, hey, go pick out a lamb or a young goat for each of of your families. I need you to slaughter the Passover animal, drain the blood into a basin. Aren't you glad we're not in the old covenant? Drain the blood into a basin, then take a bundle of hyssop branches and dip it into the blood and brush the hyssop across the tops and the sides of the door, door frames for your houses and so that no one may go out through the door until morning for the Lord's going to pass through in the land and strike down the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the door frame, the Lord's going to pass over your home for he will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. God was telling Moses that I need, I, need you to, I need you to apply the blood to the door frames of your house. So when the death angel comes through to kill the firstborn of, of every family, when he sees the blood, the blood will be a marker that this is a household of faith. That when the blood will be a marker that these people know the power of God, it'll be a marker that this house has it figured out, that they have applied the blood to the doorpost. And even though the death angel's in the neighborhood, the death angel's not going to come knocking. And I've come to remind you that there is absolutely protection in the power of the blood it brings protection come on here's why I want to say it the devil might tempt you but if you have applied the blood he can't touch you I'm not saying if you're under the blood I'm t- I will say this knowing the bl- knowing about the blood and pleading and applying the blood is two different things Knowing about the blood is one thing, but knowing when I plead the blood and when I apply the blood, that's different. I'm not saying that you'll never be attacked. I'm not saying that you'll never go through a struggle. No, that's in the Bible that temptations of many will come and difficult days will come and you get used to going through hard days. It's not that we will not go through hard times, but the Bible says to let, to, to, To not touch my anointed. What is the anointing? Not the gift. It's the blood that is covering that of the person following Christ. And so I just want to tell you, there is protection in the blood. There's protection. People say, man, this world's getting crazy. I can't believe it's getting bad. How much? Can I tell you? It has been wrote in this book ever since it was written. It's not going to get better. 
Darkness will keep taking ground. Darkness will continue to do what darkness does. Bad things are going to happen. Culture and society are going to continue to push their godless agenda. It's going to happen. It's been wrote about. Our election will not fix the issue. Another election will not fix the issue. But I want to tell you is, but the blood of God applied to your life will fix the issue. They're going to keep coming after your kids. They're going to keep pushing their, their, their crazy indoctrination. But can I tell you, apply the blood on your kids. Apply the blood on your family. Apply the blood on your front door. I, I'm not saying go home and kill a heifer and drain the blood into a basin and go get an oak tree branch and start. Not, I'm not saying that. But I am saying symbolically you might go get some olive oil. Yeah. Yeah. Now your neighbor's going to think you're crazy, but hey, when that death angel comes through, my house is covered. Some, some of you, you need to take your kids along the journey today. Go get some oil. We're going to anoint our front door. Just reminding the devil, if he wants to come pick on this house, this house has already pleaded the blood. See, I, there's not a day goes by I don't plead the blood of, of Christ over my kids and my family. I, I know that knowing about the blood is one thing, but there is power when you learn to plead the blood and to apply the blood. How about this? Number three, the blood gives us authority. The blood gives us power and authority. Revelation 12, 11 says this, and they have defeated him. I can stop right there. They have defeated I'm not an English scholar. I'm not very good at writing. I'm not really good at literature. I barely, I had to pay my senior teacher to give me an A in her class. I'm not that good at literature, but I do know past tense when I see past tense. Defeated means we have already won the battle. This is the Bible. Revelation 12, 11. They have they have. That's me and you. That's our church. That's God's church. Those of us that are in Christ Jesus, saved by his grace, covered in his blood. That promise says we've already defeated it. It gives a whole new revelation to, oh, although the weapon may be formed, it will not prosper. Why? Because we've already defeated. The Bible says they have defeated him, lowercase h, which tells me that's not a proper noun. But that's something that's not really important. Him being the devil. So what the, I'm just trying to help you today. They have defeated him by the blood of the lamb. Not just the blood of the lamb. Hold on. Not just the blood. It says this. And that tells me there's something else that's got to go with the blood in order for us to defeat him. This is where you and I come into play. Because our blood can't help, but his blood can and they have defeated him by the blood of the capital L, Lamb, that means Jesus, and by the word of their testimony. And testimony is a fancy word for a story of life change. And everybody here, when you come to know Jesus, you have a testimony, or you have a story of God's amazing grace, how he changed you, saved you, and redeemed you. And so the blood gives us power and authority. And I was studying, I, I was studying, preparing this, this sermon. We were out of town and spending a few days away. And can I just tell you, I hate snakes. Hate them. I, a couple of things I'm going to ask Jesus when I get to heaven is why does Mexican food make you fat? And why did you leave snakes on earth? You ever wondered why everything good for you tastes horrible? But every, maybe it's just me today, but that's, just, that's, that's the questions. I don't wrestle with theological issues. I wrestle with things like, God, why do Oreo cookies put rolls on my stomach? <laughs> just one of the questions I'm going to ask him when I get there. But I was like, man, I hate snakes. And I always say this way, like, the only good snake is a dead snake. You can cut its tail off right behind its head. 
I'm just one of these guys. Call me weird. Call me super spiritual. But I know in my life, in our family's life, that any time that we have, we have, we have had snakes on our front porch, and any time that we have a snake in our midst, we know that it is a sign that something is about ready to attack our life. And I'm telling you, every single time it's taken place, it's a big warning sign for the Holy Spirit saying, hey, brace yourself, something bad's about ready to happen. Whether it be somebody betray us, whether it be somebody spread false things about me, whether it's something we got to make sure we got our eyes on. And I'm just one of these guys that believe, I, 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 just, I just despise snakes. We happen to be in South Carolina, the rattlesnake capital of the world. I'm just trying to get a little sun, trying to get my mind ready for Easter. And everywhere I go, there's these big yellow signs, beware of the snakes. How can I relax <laughs> everywhere I go like the devil is a liar? So I begin, to, I begin to just study the snake, and I begin to study the snake bites. And we live in West Virginia, so we have rattlesnakes, we have copperheads, deadly bites, right? If you don't get to the hospital quick, it can kill you. So I started studying anti-venom and come across this story that in Thomasville, Georgia, is the rattlesnake capital of America. It's the center of America's snake belt. Snakes there, they're everywhere, from suburban garages to sugarcane fields. For a, near, a nearby town even has a rattlesnake roundup, count me out. <laughs> Where the serpents are gathered annually, not to kill them, but to have their lethal venom milked. Milk the venom and kill them. That's a picture of some of us. We capture the sin and we milk it, but we don't kill it and we release it only to come back six months later and start attacking our life again. But in this leafy Georgia town, the research shows that a local hospital treats a snake bite every fourth night. And Thomasville may be in the thick of the action, but Research shows that it is, it is miles and miles and miles and miles away from the hills of South Wales where the most radical advances in anti-venom technology have been discovered. Scientists have discovered that the blood of sheep are immune to snake bites. You don't got to be a preacher to preach that. Research. This is not something I made up. This is not some Christian. Pro I, found, I found the worldliest of worldly professors and scientists, and I've taken their material, and I'm preaching it God's way. Says that they are immune to snake bites. In fact, a sheep's blood is now used to make the antidote for snake venom. To make the antidote, sheep are injected with a snake's venom in other words, Christian people are faced with an attack. We are born into sin. We wrestle with sin, but we have natural antibodies by the blood of Christ already within us that gives us the power to overcome every snake bite that the enemy has sent our way. Could it be, could it be why John 129 makes so much more sense to me this morning? that the lamb who takes away the sins of the world? How does he do it? He does it by the blood. Come on, the blood not only gives us power, the blood not only gives us authority, but the blood actually gives us a chance to have our sins forever erased. There's power in the blood. Please understand, it's not that your life's gonna be perfect when you get saved. Your life just now comes under the authority and the blood of Jesus Christ. It means you don't ever have to work your way again, but you are saved and your sins are covered. That's what the Bible says. And so today as I close, I just, I, I want to I ask you today, is, is your life under the blood? Is your heart right? Because Jesus' blood can cover your sin. If we could have did it through works, he wouldn't have shed it on the cross. 
If we could have did it through money, he wouldn't have shed his blood on the cross. But because Jesus went to the cross and he shed his blood, can I tell you if it was just me or if it was just you, he still would have went to the cross anyway? And Jesus knew that it one drop of blood, not just to pay my sin debt for yesterday or my sin debt today, but he said, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to make a final payment once and for all for all of humanity, whether they accept it or receive it, my blood will still be good to cover it. 